So that gives you a sense of how much the landscape has changed. Let me just give you a little sense of what typical authorizers are like for charter schools in the United States. Here I've said most of the authorizers are local universities, although I believe that the St. Louis City School District can also authorize uh, charter schools. In New York, where we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, evidence, New York is more typical for, um, for the US. So the regents of New York State, who are sort of like your uh, it would be like the, the regions of the state university system, um, authorize about 7% of the charter schools in New York City. The New York City Schools Chancellor, who you may know is Joel Klein, he gets into the New York Times all the time, he authorizes about 43% of the charter schools and the rest are authorized by the State University of New York uh, trustees. So that's a, that's a fairly typical pattern. Some are authorized by universities, some are authorized by school districts, and some are authorized by uh, something like the Board of Regents, which is involved with education. That's, that's pretty normal for the US. In terms of who manages charter schools on a day-to-day -day basis, there are three basic different forms of management. The first is community-grown organizations. These are nonprofits that usually have a local base. They might have started out as a local volunteer organization or a local community support organization, and they, they start up charter schools. I think of them as, these are the mom and pop charter schools, essentially, because they're startups from the ground. The other two types run chains of charter schools. And I have to say, I think that these are probably the future of many charter schools in the United States, because some of them are so successful. And as they succeed, they create more and more charter schools that have the same essential management model. Now, the nonprofits are called charter management organizations, and a famous one is KIPP schools. And the for-profit ones are called educational management organizations, and a famous educational management organization is Edison schools. But let me tell you, there's really not a lot of difference because none of them ever make any profits, so the distinction is purely, is purely nominal. No one ever makes any profits, so they're all basically charter management organizations. Now, this is a, gives you a sense of what different charter schools do in the United States. They don't all have the same mission. I told you they were autonomous, and the whole point of being autonomous is that you don't all have to do the same thing, and there can be different models of what you think is the right school. So this is an, a reading school's mission statements. This is our attempt to summarize what we think charter schools do. About 25% of students attend charter schools that advertise that they have a rigorous academic focus. They say something like, we want every child to go to college, and we want every child to go to a good college. About 28% of students attend a charter school that has more of a traditional or general focus. They'll say things like, we want every child to graduate from high school and have the following set of skills and get a good job. But they're not emphasizing uh, academics quite as much. Uh, Child-centered charter schools, um, these would also might be called progressive. So these are charter schools where if the mission statement says something like, we want every child to bloom like a little flower, then we would know that was a child-centered uh, <laughs> charter school. Targeted student demographics, these are usually all girls, all boys, all people who wish to be sailors, all people who wish to be in construction. That would be a targeted student demographic school, and that's only about 11% of students. A targeted curriculum is usually something where all the students want to do the same sort of curriculum. So a school for the arts would be an example of that, and that's about 7% of charter schools. So the vast majority of them are in this rigorous academic fo focus, a traditional uh, focus and a child-centered uh, focus. But you can see they're diverse. They're not all the same. They, they really start off with a lot of different models. Let me tell you about some of the policies that, because I think this is really interesting, that some charter schools have that regular public schools do not have. And remember, these are public schools, so they do not have any policies that are illegal in the public sector. It's not like anything they're doing is against the rules for regular public schools to adopt. They just don't tend to adopt the same set of policies. So first, the long school day, eight or more hours a day. 55% of New York City charter school students are in schools that have eight or more hours a day. In fact, it's not uncommon to have a charter school which will start at 7 in the morning and finish at 5.30 or 6 p.m. at night. So it covers the entire day, and part of that would be extracurriculars and homework time. But for a parent, you would drop them off at 7 and pick them up at 5.30 or 6. Um, a long school year, that's 190 or more days, about 64% of them have a long school year. 
Why is that important? What's, first of all, what's the normal length of a school year in America? It's about 178 days, 176 days. So this is at least a few more weeks. Some of these charter schools in the United States have school years as long as 220 days. That is eight more weeks, or eight and a half more weeks of school. And you can imagine what that does. That really covers a lot of the summer, and it means that parents don't have as, um, as much um, time to have to cover uh, their students, their child's childcare and things like that. 67% of them have Saturday school. This is like Japan, okay? <laughs> Saturday school where you have to go, uh, at least if you're not doing very well in, in school. Three or more hours of English and math each day. That's about 54%. Uh, I'll skip student faculty advisory because that takes a little bit of explanation. Most of them have routine internal assessments. These are diagnostic exams designed to figure out whether kids are doing well or not. And those are very routine in charter schools. More than half of them have a parent contract. This is obviously not enforceable. You can't enforce a contract with parents. But you can try to set up expectations with parents and make it clear to them your child really has to show up five days of the week unless he's sick. He really has to do his homework and all sorts of things like that. Small rewards, small punishments discipline. Uh, this is also called no broken windows discipline. And the idea is here that you don't wait until a student has knifed the student next to him, and then you send him down to the vice principal's office, or the equivalent, okay? Instead, the first time a student kicks the student next to him, you punish him just a little bit, and the first time he's polite to the student next to him and says, helps him or something, you give him a little reward. So there are lots of little rewards and little punishments in these systems. Sometimes points are given out, sometimes it's not points, it's just encouragement of small rewards, small punishments, and most of the discipline would take, class in the, take place in the classroom, not at the vice principal's office. And then finally, most of them require uh, school uniforms in New York City, over 90%. Over so this will give you a sense that they are doing something that's quite different than the regular public schools. The other thing that they do differently is they hire teachers differently and they compensate them differently. So how do they, what do their teachers look like compared to those of the regular public schools? Well, they hire teachers who are essentially somewhat higher in aptitude, but lower on regular teaching credentials and higher on things like math and science courses, which we tend to have problems getting teachers who have a lot of math and science education in the United States. And finally, they hire teachers who self-report. These are all teachers self-reporting how many hours of instruction they have each week, how many hours, extra instructional hours do they have per week. Well, charter school teachers report teaching many more extra instructional hours per week. And you can see that they have somewhat higher aptitude and they're more likely to have science courses from college, also math, but I just, I'm showing you science there. Okay, so they're hiring people with fewer regular teaching credentials, but more of these other things, more willingness to work the extra hours and somewhat higher aptitude. And how do they manage to do this? Well, instead of compensating teachers in lockstep the way regular public schools normally do in the US, that would mean everyone with the same teaching credential gets paid exactly the same amount if they have the same experience, Charter schools tend to compensate teachers more for attributes that a regular public school would not, uh, would not pay them for. So the increase in pay associated with having higher aptitude in charter schools is many, many times higher than it is in the regular public schools where it's basically close to zero. The increase in pay for having more college science or math courses is again uh, double in the regular double in the charter schools what it is in the regular public schools. And the increase in pay for working extra instructional hours is again more than double in the charter schools what it is in the regular public schools. So the way that they get these different teachers is essentially by going out there and hiring them and then compensating them uh, to, to ensure that they get a somewhat different population of teachers. So that's the other way in which they differ. Some of you will have perhaps read in the newspapers about a charter school in New York City that has decided to pay teachers really well on the theory that they will be able to attract a different sort of teacher. So they're going to be paying them uh, between $100,000 and $200,000 very differently than your typical uh, teacher is paid and they're trying to attract a different sort of teacher. So that's a dramatic example. That's not normal in, among charter schools, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. <laughs>